All righty. Let's take a look tonight. We're going to uh, look at the Old Testament, and the uh, area of the Old Testament we're going to look, it may seem a little dry. So, everybody, um, I figured that since it was raining outside, I'd bring you a dry message tonight. No, I'm just kidding. It's not a dry message. Oh, Oklahoma humor. See, I've been around my wife too much. Oh, Lord, save me. It's infecting. Anyway, it's bad. I know it is. But hang with me, because I do believe that there is, there is something here in principle that is exemplified in the Old Testament. Uh, whenever I teach my home Bible studies to folks, I always uh, let them know that one of the chief important things to recognize about the Old Testament and the covenant that God made with the people of Israel is that what God did was he was putting in place what Paul calls the schoolmaster. One who is preparing for the perfect, which of course the perfect came when Christ was able to come and present himself as the sinless Lamb of God, the one who died for the sins of the world. In laying this whole covenant relationship out, God was also making a fundamental move. Because up until this point, once sin entered the world, God and humanity had been separated. God was distant because of the sin. Before the sin, he would walk in the cool of the evening in the garden and would commune with them. And so they had intimate contact with God. But after that, you have narrow contact and limited contact. You hear of Enoch. You hear of Noah. You hear of Abraham. You hear of Isaac. You hear of Jacob. But these are individuals. You've heard me reference before that, you know, Abraham only heard from God like nine times in his entire walk with God. And so God is very distant. Well, with the covenant, that was instituted at Mount Sinai, God created a mechanism to move in very close to his people. Now understand that that closeness was still very distant. It, very distant. The temple courtyard, or excuse me, the tabernacle courtyard, no one except the Levites could enter there. Only the people of Israel could peek through the entrance into the courtyard. And when they did, all they could see was a brazen altar and a brazen laver and the outer badger skins of the tabernacle. Of the Levites, only Aaron ever went into the Holy of Holies. And he only entered once a year. So while it was spectacular in comparison to the years preceding, to have that pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night there, the outward signal that the Shekinah presence of God was present there within the Holy of Holies, you still had massive distance between God and His people. But compared to preceding times, God was up close and personal. They knew when to move camp when that pillar of cloud or that pillar of fire began to move. In fact, God taught them the trust in him because he told them, put your tents facing inward. Now, when you build a camp with that many people, you don't build your tents facing inward. You build your tents facing outward so that you see enemy headed towards you. But he said, no, you put them inward because if you put your eyes on me, I, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, looking out for you, I will guard you. I will warn you. And you can imagine what kind of deterrent it would be if you at nighttime were trying to sneak up on the camp and you look in there in the, in the sky as a ball of fire, you know, a pillar of fire. That'd be a little freaky. That'd make you think twice about sneaking into that camp. So in the midst of this, you have God still maintaining for the safety of the people a distance. But he is making a big step to be in their presence. And in the midst of that, I want to look tonight, and I want us to look at specifically the ark. And I want to look at atonement. And so uh, I turn your attention to Exodus chapter 25, and it is on the board behind me. And uh, I'm going to read you a few verses here. And so stay awake, Tracy. You're going to help Nancy back there stay awake. 
All right. Now, no yakking. Just stay awake. I know uh, ladies sometimes have to get separated. You're almost as bad as teen, the teen class. Have to separate you of that. But no yakking, but stay awake. All right. Nancy's been doing a good job the last two Wednesday nights. She come in very tired, but she stayed awake. So Good. Excellent. Well, let's see if we can add a little bit to what you learned. And uh, hopefully God has a little something extra to add in there. All right. So verse 10. The instructions God gives to Moses, he says, have the people make an ark of acacia wood, or acacia wood, a sacred chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold, and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from a of wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings. Never remove them. When the ark is finished, place, it, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then make the ark's cover the place of of atonement. That's what everybody, I want you to notice that, okay? Make the ark's cover the place of atonement from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherubim from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. Now, what I want to reference here is I want you to notice, I will meet with you there and talk to you above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. So what God has done here is he's created a space that is roughly analogous to what used to exist in the garden. Because the description we have of the garden is that God would come in the cool of the evening and he would walk with them and he would converse with them. He would communicate with them. And now God has created, it's limited. But he has created a space to communicate with his chosen people. The ancestors, the descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Jacob's 12 sons. And so God is now through Moses and through the covenant as a feature of the covenant, as a part of the covenant. He has created a space for himself among the people. And this space is a space of atonement. The King James Version uses the word the mercy seat. But the more rigid or, or accurate wording from the literal text is the place of atonement. The place where people are made right with God. This is where God is going to dwell. Between the wings of the cherubim, above the atonement cover, above the flat part of the Ark of the Covenant, there he will speak. There he will interact. There the people can be made right with him. Now, clearly, God is intending to dwell with his people. He has drawn out a group from Egypt. He has with his mighty right hand delivered them. He has given them the ability to now be a people that are not slaves but are free. And he's trying to create relationship with them. Now, everybody's going to pay attention because the babies are riled tonight. Has everybody picked that up? All of them are riled, every one of them. Jacques is riled, Zach is riled, Lily's riled, everybody's riled, all right? So if you adults stay focused, the parents will take care of the kids, and I'll yell over them, okay? A deal? You got it? But I need you to focus. 
The babies will be taken care of by the parents. They may not get much. It's recorded, Nick. If you need to go back and listen to it, you can do it. All right? All right? Absolutely. All I'm talking to you is I just need you to focus, not pay, worrying about the babies. Everything's fine. They'll be okay. But, uh, oh, look at that. Even faith is in here. So, you know, hey, it's, it's how it all works together. It's one of those nights. So uh, we don't worry about it. I bet Kids Bible Night is a live wire, too. Um, it's rainy. Is it? Is it a live wire? Oh, yeah, they're all unhinged. So you all stay focused. I'll stay focused, and we'll be all right, okay? All right. Now, with that, because I just need to acknowledge it, because I saw you all. Your heads were swiveling, and you, some of you older folks were going, oh, my goodness, I can't take it. Yes, you can. You only got to make it another 45 minutes, so you'll be fine. Behave yourself, Kareem. The three stooges have, have taken up new residents. There they are. All right. So God creates this space. It's a space whereby the people can be made right with him. Okay? But with the atonement come instructions. Now, trust me, I'm not reading you every one of the instructions tonight. That would be a really dry sermon. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not reading you every one of the instructions. But with the atonement come instructions. In our modern day society, we're all about being made right with God. Just don't tell me what to do. Can I get an amen from somebody? Make me right with you. Don't send me to hell. Let me get saved. But don't be pushy, God. Okay? And we need to be honest about it because it, it pervades all of us. It affects all of us. I'm going to do what I think is right. Don't be being bossy about this. Okay? Now, I, I'm not trying to be pushy about this, but I, I need everybody to look in the mirror tonight. I need everybody to be honest with me and, and with yourselves. You're not talking to me, but let's, let's be honest together that we, we tend to want the goods without any cost. And what we have here is that God is making a fundamental shift. He's making a fundamental move. Instead of Noah built a boat and then God shuts the door and, you know, he doesn't have much contact with Noah. I mean, over the span of 200 years, God talks to Noah about three times. Abraham, what would you say, nine times that you've told me? Nine times over the span of 100, 100 years or more. That, that Nine times. I mean, some of us have a cow if God doesn't speak to us daily. You should be speaking to God, but it's all right for him to be quiet every once in a while. He might not have anything to say. I mean, don't be neurotic about it, okay? Okay, don't be freaking yourself out here. If you've done what was right, have faith in God. Walk in that faith. Okay, you don't need to be affirmed all the time. But God's making a fundamental shift to a new relationship, a closer relationship, headed towards, of course, the ultimate close relationship, because you all know, where does that Shekinah presence of God now dwell? He does not dwell between angels' wings above the atonement seat. He now dwells in your heart. He lives inside of you. I mean, you're glad to be filled with the Spirit. You are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. You now are where the atonement's happening. He's put a new heart in you with his instructions written on that heart so that you can obey by the power of the Spirit. So God's on a march to redeem his people. He's on a march to make them right with him. But the atonement comes with instructions. Now I want to draw your attention to just one example about the atonement. And the atonement cover. So look at Leviticus chapter 9. Now, we're told that after the ordination ceremony, on the eighth day, Moses called together Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He says to Aaron, take a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defects, and present them to the Lord. Then tell the Israelites, take a male goat for a sin offering, Take a calf and a lamb, both a year old and without defects, for a burnt offering. 
Also take a bull and a ram for a peace offering and flour moistened with olive oil for a grain offering. Present all these offerings to the Lord because the Lord will appear to you today. This is a good day, right? The Lord's going to show up. You're going to have the presence of the Lord. Again, analogous to the garden. So the people presented all these things at the entrance of the tabernacle, what I call the tabernacle courtyard. They can't enter in, but they bring them to the entrance just as Moses had commanded. Then the whole community came forward and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering to purify yourself and the people. Then present the offerings of the people to purify them, making them right with the Lord, just as he has commanded. And if you study this and actually another passage that I'm going to read to you, you'll see that that first burnt offering and that first uh, sin offering were, in fact, for Aaron and his family as the priests so that then they could be pure to then offer the sacrifices for the people before the Lord. Okay? So Aaron went to the altar and slaughtered the calf as a sin offering for himself. His sons brought him the blood, and he dipped his finger in it, put it on the horns of the altar. He poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Then he burnt, burned on the altar the fat, the kidneys, and the long lobe of the liver. liver. The long lobe of the liver. Man, you can't say that one very fast. The long lobe of the liver from the sin offering, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The meat and the hide, however, he burned outside the camp. Next, Aaron slaughtered the animal for the burnt offering. His sons brought him the blood, and he splattered it against all sides of the altar. Then they handed him each piece of the burnt offering, including the head, and he burned them on the altar. Then he washed the internal organs and the legs and burned them on the altar, along with the rest of the burnt offering. Next, Aaron presented the offering of the people. He slaughtered the people's goat and presented it as an offspring, excuse me, as an offering for their sin, just as he had first done with the offering for his own sin. Then he presented the burnt offering and sacrificed it in the prescribed way. He also presented the grain offering, burning a handful of the flour mixture on the altar in addition to the regular burnt offering for the morning. Then Aaron slaughtered the bull and the ram for the people's peace offering. His sons brought him the blood, and he splattered it against all sides of the altar. Then he took the fat of the bull and the ram, the fat of the broad tail, and from around the internal organs, along with the kidneys and the long lobes of the livers. He placed these fat portions on top of the breasts of these animals and burned them on the altar. Aaron then lifted up the breasts and right thighs as a special offering to the Lord, just as Moses had commanded. After that, Aaron raised his hands toward the people and blessed them. Then after presenting the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering, he stepped down from the altar. Then Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle, and when they came back out, they blessed the people again. And after all of the instructions had been obeyed, after all of the details had been fulfilled, the glory of the Lord appeared to the whole community. Fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence. Now, where's the Lord's presence? It's from the atonement cover. That's where God is. So fire blazes forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. That must have been amazing. Because if you look at it, it was quite a bit of distance. Talk about a flamethrower. Okay? So it blazes forth. It burns up the uh, burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When the people saw this, they shouted with joy, and they fell face down on the ground. All sounds good, right? Notice the specificity, the detail that is involved. Chapter 10. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died before the Lord. So the same presence of the Lord, the same location, and the same response with very different results. All emanating from the atonement cover and all based upon obedience or disobedience 
to the instructions. When Aaron obeyed the instructions, the Lord struck out in his power and showed his glory by receiving their offering, by burning up the fat, by burning up the sacrifice. When Nadab and Abihu decided they were going to do what God had said, but do it their way. Does everybody see this? you got to get this in principle. Not just the specific example, but in principle. They were burning incense before the Lord, which they were supposed to do. But they were going to do it their way. They chose to use their fire. My point tonight, and we could talk about this, that you want true worship to go up before the Father, you need to have that fueled by an altar of repentance. I could preach on that for a while, but that's not the point tonight. That's where the fire was to come from. The fire had to come from the altar. When they disobeyed God's commands, when they didn't follow the instructions, the very place God created among his people to affect atonement, to make them right with him, was the very place that executed them. So tonight, you've got to ask yourself a question. If God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, what makes sure the place of atonement saves me and doesn't kill me? Kind of a legitimate question, wouldn't you think? Especially when I read in the New Testament that at the end of days, God will sit at a white throne. And depending upon my obedience to his instructions, two different things will happen from that same throne. From that throne, people will be banished because of the judgments of their works into eternal torment. And from that same throne, people will be ushered into eternity in the presence of God on the basis not of their works, but of the works of the sacrificial Lamb of God. What makes the atonement cover? What makes the place of atonement be a place of life as opposed to a place of death. Literally, as Leviticus presents it to us, within moments of one another, it was a place of life as God received the instructed obedience of Aaron and the people. And it was a place of death. As the boys who knew better said, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it my way. Now you understand why I need to say this to you. Because we live in a generation that says, hey, I want to be saved. But you're going to save me my way. I'm going to take your word and I'm going to pick the pieces I like. And I'm going to create the gospel I want. And I'm going to create God in my image. And God, if you really are the God you claim to be, you won't send me to hell. You're going to do it my way. I'm here tonight with some bad news. God is not going to do it our way. He's been doing it his way. And he will never stop doing it his way. You say, well, that's, that's arrogant of God. Well, the last time I checked, the only way I can know that somebody's being arrogant is by looking at what everybody else is doing and drawing comparison. You can't do that with God, for there is none other God but him. So it's not arrogant. He is what he is. And he loves you. He's made fundamental moves. Here we have the example in the Old Testament. But in our own lives, he's made fundamental moves to draw nigh to us. To draw close to us. 
to engage with us, to be in our lives. But the atonement comes with instructions. Very specific instructions. Very specific instructions. So the fire, verse 2, blazed forth from the Lord's presence, burned them up, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who, may, who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. Yeesh. I'm not sure I want God showing his holiness off. What's he referring to, though? Is it the fire that came out and burned up the sacrifice? Or is it the fire that came out and burned up the disobedience? Same fire, same God, same location, but different result. You can have the holiness of God displayed in your life. It's just a matter of whether it burns up your sin or does it burn up you. I'm going to say that one more time so everybody gets a hold of that. You can have the holiness of God displayed in your life. It's just a matter of whether it burns up your sin, your sacrifice. You obey him and you stick it on the altar and he burns it up. Or does it burn up you because you insist on doing your own thing? I can have the atonement of God, the made right with God. I can have it burn up my sin. Listen to that. You put on the altar the sacrifice of your sin and God receives you. That's amazing. He brings, he says, bring me your junk. Bring me your hurts. Bring me your pain. Bring me all that's wrong with you. And if you will genuinely follow my instructions and place it upon the altar, the fire of my presence and the glory of my holiness will receive it. But if you insist on doing your own thing, that same fire that was intended to make you right will destroy you. I'm not trying to scare anybody. i got nobody in mind. All I know is, is I think you want to know about this. Because if this is the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever, I think I want to know about this now. I don't want to find, about, find out about this when I get to the white throne judgment. I don't want to find out about this at the end of the days. I want to know this is how God's operating right now. And it's your choice. Scripture says, and Aaron was silent. Then Moses called for Mishael and Elzaphan, Aaron's cousins, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel. He said to them, come forward and carry away the bodies of your relatives from in front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. So they came forward, they picked them up by their garments and carried them out of the camp, just as Moses had commanded. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, do not show grief by leaving your hair uncombed or by tearing your clothes. If you do, you will die. And the Lord's anger will strike the whole community of Israel. However, the rest of the Israelites, your relatives, may mourn because of the Lord's fiery destruction of Nadab and Abihu. But you must not leave the entrance of the tabernacle or you will die. For you have been anointed with the Lord's anointing oil. So they did as Moses commanded. I want to insert something here. And I did not plan to do this tonight, but I'm going to insert it. It's going to be very quick. You have feel a call upon your life to preach the gospel. Let me tell you what that means. That means you will stand with the anointing of God and you may not use your family as an excuse for not fulfilling it. This is why you feel a call of God upon your life. Run, baby, run. Run with all of your might and try to get away from it. And if he'll let you get away from it, then count yourself lucky. Look at what these gentlemen had to do. Now, I'm not saying I'm a high priest. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that anybody's called to preach as a high priest. But it is in an analogous position of the anointing of God for a specific purpose to fulfill service to his people. Did everybody get that? It is an anointed place called by God, placed there for the express purpose of being God's to serve his people. Aaron stood there while his son's charred bodies were dragged away. And he could not mourn. He could not cut his hair. He could not throw dust upon himself. He could not sully himself because God's calling upon him and the function of him within the body required that he serve God 
And his son's choices had to be his son's choices. And some of you have looked at me a little cross-eyed when I've preached to my kids. You've wondered what I was doing. I'm trying to tell them, don't mess with God. You mess with God, I can't come cry over you. I can't come walk with you. I can't follow you. And I'm not going to. So you feel a call upon your life. You better understand God's not playing because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, we're not high priests. No, we don't go in and make sacrifices on behalf of people. But we are still in a place of service called by God to serve his people. And God's not playing. God's not playing. He's deadly serious. So Aaron stood there. Eleazar and Ithamar stood there as their sons or their brothers, depending on which one they are. Eleazar and Ithamar are their brothers. Aaron, his two sons, as they're drug away. And they carried out their service to God. If you have been exposed to pastors and preachers who have not fulfilled this duty, pray for them because God will hold them accountable. If you've ever seen, been exposed to, where family trumped the call of God, pray for them. I pray God have mercy upon them. Because this picture tells me it's not good. You want to know why this church is secure? Because you got two people, the founding pastor and now me. We don't play this game. We take this seriously. I go bad now and Pop will take me out. Might not win. Every year that goes by, it'll get weaker and weaker and weaker. But he'll still come at me. You'll have a choice. I leave this gospel, and you will have a choice. He will not comply. I can promise you as long as I'm alive, whoever comes in here after me, you will have a choice. All right, that's an aside. I didn't plan on that. That wasn't in any notes. I don't have any notes anyway, but I, I didn't plan on dealing with that. But you need to know that. You need to understand that. God's not playing. And if you think preaching and, and pastoring and all that is all the glory days of being up in the pulpit and the anointing and stuff, no, you not got to understand. There are going to be times you're going to stand there while charred bodies are going by and you ain't moving. So when I do preach to my kids, don't sit on me. Because I'd rather fire them up right now than watch them walk off charred because I didn't warn them. So you give me space because I love my five idiots. I want them with me. I don't want to watch them walking away. Church, say amen. If you did it by compulsion, I understand. I made you do it. It's all right. God knows that I made you do it. Now, let's look at chapter 16. Chapter 16, we get the description of the Day of Atonement. This is where the atonement cover becomes pivotal. Okay? Let's take a look at this. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons, who died after they entered the Lord's presence and burned the wrong kind of fire before him. So it's what we just saw in chapter 9. The Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement is there. And I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. So this is all about the presence of God. This is all about God being there. He says the reason they don't get to go in there is not because the thing's gold. It's not because it's of acacia wood. It's not because the tablets of stone are in there. It's not because of the cherubims. It's that cover. That atonement cover. That place that has specifically been created for making the people right with me. Because it's there, and because it's there, I'm there. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. 
He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He must put on his linen tunic and the linen undergarments worn next to his body. He must tie the linen sash around his waist and put the linen turban on his head. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself in water before he puts them on. Aaron must take from the community of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. Then he must take the two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness of Azazel. Aaron will then present as a sin offering the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord. The other goat, the scapegoat, chosen by Lot to be sent away will be kept alive standing before the Lord. When it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness, the people will be purified and made right with the Lord. Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. After he has slaughtered the bull as a sin offering, he will fill an incense burner with burning coals from the altar that stands before the Lord. Then he will take two handfuls of fragrant powdered incense and will carry the burner and the incense behind the inner curtain. There in the Lord's presence, he will put the incense on the burning coals so that a cloud of incense will rise over the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. If he follows these instructions, he will not die. Now, this stands as an interesting contrast. I'm not done with this passage, but this stands as an interesting contrast because this is what we seem to have seen Nadab and Abihu disobey it. So on the Day of Atonement, I don't think the previous description in Leviticus chapter 9 was of a Day of Atonement. But on the Day of Atonement, God makes specific, careful instructions to Aaron. Do not make the mistake of disobeying my instructions. Because you are literally entering into a place that can either give you life or give you death. And it's your choice. Verse 14. Then he must take some of the blood of the bull, dip his finger in it, sprinkle it on each side of the atonement cover. He must sprinkle blood seven times with his finger on the front of the atonement cover. Well, what about the west side, God? What about the back side? Now, some of you are sitting here going, man, he never gets off this point. You're right. I've preached this from so many different vantage points, it isn't even funny. I preached to you from Noah. Well, God, why don't God pitch both inside and outside? Isn't outside good enough? God, can't I use the oak trees that are in my backyard? Do I really have to go find gopher wood? God, two doors would let me load the animals quicker. Can't we have three windows? I'm not trying to be rude, but ladies and gentlemen, I need you to hear my voice tonight and ask yourself an honest question. How much of your prayer life sounds like this? Because atonement and the presence of God comes with instructions. Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody off from the Holy Ghost. In fact, I think most everybody here is filled with the Holy Ghost. So let me make it a little more blunt for you. Do you realize that the very Shekinah presence that sat upon the atonement cover that flashed out in life or death is what's inside of you now? It's not on an ark. It's in you. I'm not trying to freak nobody out, but I am trying to have you get a hold of something. The atonement comes with instructions and you need to obey them. 
Don't play with him. He's going to save you. If you let him. But you got to let him. It's in your hands. There's an Old Testament passage where God says, I present to you, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. But the bad news about choice is, is you can also choose death. There's some people within the sound of my voice tonight that you have been around the presence of God for so long that you aren't taking him serious. Now, you know, most of my sermons are about the mercy, the love, and the grace of God. And those are all true. But right along with the atonement comes instructions. Jose, you need to change the title in case you didn't pick it up already. The atonement comes with instructions. That's where we need to go. Verse 14, then he must take some of the blood of the bull, dip his finger in it, sprinkle it on the east side of the atonement cover. He must sprinkle blood seven times with his finger on the front of the atonement cover. Then Aaron must slaughter the first goat as a sin offering for the people and carry its blood behind the inner curtain. There he will sprinkle the, blood's, uh, the goat's blood over the atonement cover and in front of it just as he did with the bull's blood. Through this process, he will purify the most holy place and he will do the same for the entire tabernacle because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites. See, God is not saying your sin's okay. He's just creating a way not to kill you. I'm going to say that one more time because I think some of you need to get that through your head. God is not ignoring your sin. His love is motivating him not to okay your sin, but he's creating a method that if you'll obey, then he says, I won't kill you. I'll save you. So when you tell God, God, now don't be telling me how to dress. God, don't be telling me how to talk. God, don't be telling me where I can go. God, don't be telling me what I can do with my life. This is highly stupid. You, you can't get more stupid than that. Now, I know. Here we go. I'm going to kick the pail, right, Sister Jackie? I was doing all right, and here I'm going. I'm kicking the pail. It's all right. I'm going to go ahead and kick the pail and hope, hope the milk still all right. It's stupid. The Shekinah glory of God is in you. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? This is great news and this is really bad news depending on what you do with the instructions. Now, when new people come to church, and they're trying to figure out how they're supposed to live. And they're trying to figure out how they're supposed to operate. Man, I believe God's given them lots of latitude. Because it'll take some time and he'll work with his spirit. He's got no problem moving it along. But there does come a point where God's going to plant his foot. Look you square between the eyes and say, now, do it. Am I telling you it's tonight? I don't know. What's the Shekinah inside of you telling you? What's the glory that used to sit over the atonement cover that Aaron couldn't enter into except once a year and with such trepidation? It's inside of your breast right now. No one else is allowed, verse 17, inside the tabernacle. When Aaron enters in it, enters it for the purification ceremony in the most holy place. No one may enter until he comes out again after purifying himself, his family, and all the congregation of Israel, making them right with the Lord. Then Aaron will come out, purify the altar that stands before the Lord. He will do this by taking some of the blood from the bull and the goat and putting it on each of the horns of the altar. Then he must sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times over the altar. In this way, he will cleanse it from Israel's defilement and make it holy. When Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place and the tabernacle and the altar, he must present the live goat. He will lay both of his hands on the goat's head 
and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man specially chosen for the task will drive the goat into the wilderness. As the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. So you really think the God who gave this kind of specific, careful, choreographed instructions doesn't care what you do in your home? He only cares what you do here? Seriously? No, I think he cares what you do in your home too. He don't just care how you look here. He cares how you look there. He doesn't just care where you're going on Sunday. He cares where you're going on Tuesday. When Aaron goes back into the tabernacle, he must take off the linen garments he was wearing when he entered the most holy place, and he must leave the garments there. Then he must bathe himself with water in a sacred place, put on his regular garments, and go out to sacrifice a burnt offering for himself and a burnt offering for the people. Through this process... He will purify himself and the people making them right with the Lord. He must burn all the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man chosen to drive the scapegoat into the wilderness of Azazel must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Then he may return to the camp. The bull and the goat presented as sin offerings whose blood Aaron takes into the most holy place for the purification ceremony will be carried outside the camp. The animal's hides, internal organs, and dung are all to be burned. The man who burns them must wash his clothes, bathe himself in water before returning to the camp. On the tenth day of the appointed month in early autumn, you must deny yourselves. Neither native-born Israelites nor foreigners living among you may do any kind of work. This is a permanent law for you. On that day, offerings of purification will be made for you, and you will be purified in the Lord's presence from all your sins. It will be a Sabbath day of complete rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. This is a permanent law for you. In future generations, the purification ceremony will be performed by the priest who has been anointed and ordained to serve as the high priest in place of his ancestor Aaron. He will put on the holy linen garments and purify the most holy place, the tabernacle, the altar, the priests, and the entire congregation. This is a permanent law for you to purify the people of Israel from their sins, making them right with the Lord once each year. And then it says, Moses followed all these instructions exactly as the Lord had commanded him. Kind of like the Noah passage. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The end of the chapter, thus did Noah all that God commanded him. So did he. God was making a fundamental move. He was going to be in the presence of his people. And he created a space, the atonement cover, from which he could make those people right with him. But the atonement comes with instructions. So here we are. And God has made another fundamental move. He's in the midst of his people. We are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. What an awesome opportunity. What a blessing. Just as great as that day. Instead of the distance of God, instead of a tabernacle where only the high priest could go in once a year, and you never got to even see it, now he's living in you. But I remind the church, the atonement comes with instructions. I would highly suggest you obey them. Let's stand. Would you lift your hands and your voices to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Come on.